Hello, happy Wednesday. My name is Beverly Hosford. I've got Aaron Nitschke here with me. The Dr. Aaron Nitschke. <laughs> it so is cool. I get to hang out with a doctor every Wednesday <laughs> on an FPT Live. And we are talking about hips today, hip weakness and hip tightness. So if you have hip issues, if you have clients with hip issues, if you want to learn more about your hips, if you've ever given birth via your hips, uh, I don't know. Everyone has hips, so go ahead and share this episode right now with someone you know that has hips. <laughs> it's like I always say, anyone that sleeps needs to learn about sleep science. Um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and share it real quick on Twitter and on Facebook. The more the merrier. How are you today, Erin? I'm good. Not too bad on this Wednesday. It's beautiful here, so we have a play date later, so I'm excited for that. <laughs> yes, the weather makes it really hard to be grumpy, no matter how badly you want to be grumpy. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> how are you? I'm, you know, I'm okay. I'm. Yeah. Today's one of those days that I'm, I'm just trying to keep it rolling. I'm not gonna right. lie. <laughs> so, no, but I am excited that we're talking about one of my favorite topics, which is related to anatomy. So. Here's the story. We got a great question at the NFPT, which is the National Federation of Professional Trainers. We're a personal training certification and continuing ed company. And someone asked us, is there a relationship between hip muscle weakness in some muscles and correlating tightness in others? And for those of you that are visual learners, let me put this up on the screen here. Is there a relationship between hip muscle weakness in some muscles and correlating tightness? Oh, it got cut off in others. <laughs> I was like in OT, occupational. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wait, I wonder, well, that's interesting. We yeah. could put like a, so just think about that for a moment. Is there, we'll pick out the A, is there relationship? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some quick texting magic here. <laughs> See if that'll work. Nope, <laughs> doesn't like it. All right, well anyway. <laughs> yeah, we tried. So the, the very quick answer to this is yes, like a big fat yes. There is a relationship between hip muscle weakness and tightness. Um, if you didn't know, you have 21 hip muscles. So like imagine having 21 siblings. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that sounds like the stuff nightmares are made of. <laughs> yeah, so... Or, or 21 people that you work on a team with, basically. Right. And so because there are 21, it's going to be more complicated than if there are like three or four. And none of your joints in your body really have much less than 21. I think even your knee has like 15 muscles. So, so we have all these muscles on our, our hip, and our hip has the most motions of any joint in the body. It does circumduction, it does rotation, it does abduction, adduction, flexion, and extension. It moves in all planes of motion. So there's a lot of possibilities there, which is awesome because your body has lots of options. Like if you get injured or if you have a compensation pattern. So basically, you know, it, at any given time, you might have muscles that are weak. And when you have muscles that are weak, other muscles are gonna work harder, which could make them tight. Mm -hmm. And then you might, some muscles might be tight because of uh, a way that you sit, like if you cross your legs a lot. And so, yes, there's absolutely a relationship between them. Now, what is that relationship? It's going to depend on which muscle and what position and, and stuff like that. So practically for personal trainers dealing with your clients, how would you suggest that they assess that? Hmm. Like what tools could, could we use to, to try to like determine, especially if, if we notice that a client is weak in one area or something, their body mechanics just aren't right. Yeah. If you see people squatting and something looks weird or they complain that one leg is more sore than the other after a workout, that's a sure sign that there's an imbalance in one of the muscles. And um, it, it could be that like the right side, right leg as a whole is stronger than the left. It could be that the outside of the right leg is stronger than the inside of the right leg. There's a lot of possibilities there. Um, and so the way you would assess, there are a few basic assessments that are out there in the personal trainer world, like the passive leg stretch, like mm -hmm. basically you take the, the leg into flexion and see how much flexion you have on each side. And you monitor the PSIS with one hand because once the PSIS starts pushing down into the table or mat, 
then you're no longer doing hip flexion. You're now doing spinal flexion because once you, because the body works as a chain. And so you can look at that. So you could take a look at like, do they have more hip flexion on one side or the other? And then one way people deal with that is they stretch it. Another way you can do it is instead of like stretching the leg into further hip flexion, you can actually put your hand on the other side of the leg and have them push further into hip flexion. Because mm -hmm. one thought process is the hamstrings are tight. The other thought process is that the quads and the hip flexors are weak. Yeah. So that's like the most basic assessment that's out there, but you can take that assessment and apply it in other ways. So you could actually have a person lay on the rack and take a hip into abduction, which is away from the body. Right. And you could assess the PSIS once again, because on the PSIS, which is your posterior superior iliac spine, is that <laughs> little bump in the back of your butt that like they're like little dimples. You can see them on most people. If you are looking at their back, they're like two little dimples. So you put one hand on that and then you take a leg into abduction slowly. And when you feel that PSIS move, then the, the, the back is getting involved. But see how far can I get that leg into abduction on one side and on the other side? And again, you might find that one leg has more motion than the other. And if one has more motion than the other, that's a sign that maybe that person, like even just doing that motion might help open it up. Because we don't ever really like lay on the floor. And it's kind of like when you do a snow angel. Yeah. We don't ever lay on the floor and do like a snow angel type thing in exercise, but actually it can be quite beneficial for the body. Yeah. That's interesting. I've never really thought about it that way, but yeah, that's true. Um, and that's yeah. where you, you can assess flexibility like that. Just yeah. like flexibility. The other thing you can do is assess strength. And the way you assess strength is you just maybe have them abduct their legs slightly and have them push out and support them with your arm. And this is like a concept that I'd have to, that I do actually teach in my online anatomy course for an FPT. You know, it really requires like a full day workshop. I also, I have some videos with idea where I teach this, mm -hmm. but basically you're just having someone push out in your hand gently on each side and seeing if one side has a better ability for that. And most people are pretty equal on each side, but then if you have them turn their leg out into external rotation and abduct, you're going to almost always, I find one side is stronger than the other because when we add that external rotation, we're calling upon more of the deep rotators and the glutes. And so you can do assessments like that, strength assessments. And you can do a strength assessment in any position that the hip is able to do. You could do abduction with external rotation. You can do adduction with internal rotation. You could do flexion, extension. Um, you know, there's, there's endless possibilities for muscle testing. Right. And I think, you know, one of the important things is knowing that we have more than just a handful of muscles around those joints because it's very easy. I think I think even when you're going through um, education in terms of trying to, to learn a little bit more about anatomy, it doesn't get that in depth. And so to really be able to say we have 21 hip muscles, that, that seems like there's a lot that can go wrong there. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the more moving parts means – more can break and and yeah. need maintenance. So, yeah. and I always found with clients too, almost always one side of the body is tighter than the other. Yeah, always. And and as a result, one side is almost always weaker than the other. And so, mm -hmm. to try to you know train that unilaterally mm -hmm. or assess it unilaterally is something that I would do uh, because if you're assessing it bilaterally, bilaterally, so both sides at the same time that stronger side is going to have a tendency to take over. Mm -hmm. and you're not getting a very objective picture of where that weakness is. Um, sometimes you can see it. Like I think about like the bench press, like sometimes you can see that when the bar isn't going up evenly mm -hmm. and someone's struggling on one side over the other, that's a pretty obvious weakness on that side, but it's a little bit different. I think with the hip because it has so much motion and there are so many muscles and you can turn the feet inward. You can, you can turn them outward and, you know, rotate at the hip inward or outward. And so it, there's a lot to think about. And so I think that that, that prioritizes or should prioritize for personal trainers, the need to deepen their knowledge of anatomy and understanding where the attachment is mm -hmm. on, on each, each muscle, where does it start and where does it insert into mm -hmm. just changing the angle of a foot will target a different muscle. So it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty complex assessment process if you were to go through and really try to try to target it so that you really do correct that tightness. 
Yeah, but, it can be. And you're right on air. And whatever is strong will stay strong. And whatever mm -hmm. is weak will stay weak. It's just like if you, I just saw Meyer hop on. So I'll use an example. I, I saw her write in a blog recently that um, she was like helping her daughter with her lunchbox at school or something. And the teach and the, her daughter said, mom, I'm not supposed to have you help me. My teacher wants me to do it on my own. And mm -hmm. as parents, we can handicap our children by doing things for them that they're trying to do on their own. I feel like the same thing with your body. You can handicap your body. Your, your stronger muscles are just going to do all the work and your weaker right. ones aren't going to pick up unless you actually do an isolated exercise. And I hear people in the industry poo poo isolated exercise. Like, you know, you need to do functional movement. Right. I argue that you need to do both. You need some yeah. isolated, you need some functional. And maybe you're not really into like all the nitty gritty corrective exercise. And if you're not, then you should probably find someone who is, who could work with your clients on that because Otherwise, you're kind of contributing to the problem. Like, I don't want to be rude, but if you're just having people do squats and you see something off with their hips or like they're sore on one side all the time, you might be creating an issue with them for the future. And um, we just really need to be more accountable when we're putting stress on the body. So, yeah, I, and I feel like it's hard to learn. It is hard to learn all those assessments. It takes time, but just, you know, you just got to start where you are and and pick it up and, and learn how to assess and learn how to work some isolated exercise into your programs. And yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, I think there does need to be a combination. Um, it's kind of like, you know, we, you need to have a well-rounded program. And so you should have elements of cardiorespiratory conditioning. You should have elements of flexibility. You should have a lot of elements of resistance training and, and working in all planes of motion because working in all planes of motion also helps to train the body in such a way that, you're not just strong in one direction mm -hmm. and you expose the joints and you expose the the body to all of the ways in which it can move. So mm -hmm. I think that's important. Um, yes. Functional movements are great. Compound exercises are awesome. They involve a lot of musculature. They burn more calories, all of that. Uh, but nonetheless, if there's a weakness somewhere, it will remain a weakness until mm -hmm. that weakness is identified. Like, yeah. Until you find it. And, and yeah, yeah thinking practically, because it is a lot to absorb or to think about like one of the classic exercises is lay on your side and mm -hmm. there's and yeah and lift your leg up and down into abduction mm -hmm. now when we're just like doing this and not thinking about it and we're chatting with our trainer or we're in a group fitness class and we're looking in the mirror when we're doing that if if you're doing it haphazardly you're working your hip but you might also be working your spine because as i said when the hip runs out of motion the spine side bends so slowing that move down and going only as far as you feel your hip moving and not your back and then coming back down, but then taking a step further and bringing it up and just holding it there. Because yeah. when we're moving, it's a lot harder to, to, for the body to like stabilize than if we're just holding. So if you just hold it there, and what I like to do is have people hold that leg up and then internally and externally rotate the hip while holding it in abduction. And that's a great way to create that balance between those two hips. It's one of my favorite exercises to do with people. Mm -hmm. but if they can't hold their leg up for that long, then you, know, you just give them a break in between. Mm -hmm. And of course, you should take a break before you flip sides because the cool thing about your gluteus medius muscle, which is the abductor muscle, one of the main ones, is when you're working one, you're always working the other. So when you're laying on that bench and you're lifting one up, the other one is pushing down. Mm -hmm. So I would give, I, I would always do like, the left side, then have someone lay on their back and do some core work and then do the right side because the right side has been working too. So that's an, just a fun tip for you guys. Yeah, no, it's it's so true. And the same t is to be said if you're in like some sort of bird dog position too. Just because one one side is maybe the stabilizer doesn't mean it's not working. Yeah. So yeah, you're going to, chances are, and you should, you should feel it in both sides. So yeah. I think that's a really good tip is having people take that break and making sure that you're not over exhausting the, the side that stabilized just because it wasn't the one in action, so to speak. Yeah. So. yeah. When you get someone doing an isolated exercise like that, it can actually be a lot more work for the body than some of these ones that are like jumping squats or whatever. So, right. that, you know, and those can, what I tell people, you know, if you're resistant to using assessments or isolated exercises, use them at the beginning of the session as a warm up. Or even use them at the end as the cool down. Just sneak yeah. them in wherever you have to. And I, I would always, like, I think it was like when I was training all the time, Mondays was like hip day where I would start everyone's warm up with a couple little hip isolated exercises. And 
And yeah, surely studying the anatomy is, you know, you may or may not be like rattling off muscle names to your clients or whatever, right. but it builds your appreciation for what's going on and it clues you into what might be the imbalance. And then, you know, you can understand it at a deeper level. And it, it surely always makes you look more confident when you do know a couple muscle names instead of not knowing them. Right. Like, yeah, exactly. Or making them up. Uh, don't do that. Um, and I think another really good way to learn is practicing on your, on yourself. So practicing those assessments on yourself as the trainer, so you can understand how it feels and you can then identify areas of your own body that are going to be tight and weak. We all have them. Um, so that's a really good way to, I think, subjectively understand how it would feel, how it should feel, um, and how it does feel for you. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever worked with a person, maybe one person or two people that didn't have an imbalance in their ability to abduct their hips. And I rarely find anyone that has symmetry and hip flexion. And I'm not trying to make people perfect or perfectly symmetrical, but those asymmetries can be improved upon. They may not ever be perfect or symmetrical, but they can always be improved upon. And so, uh, right. you know, yeah, you as a trainer should absolutely sometime, you can even just put one of those loop bands around your ankles and lay on the floor and just push out into the loop band a little bit on the right and a little bit on the left. And you might just there be able to feel either like your hips will tilt or one leg will want to flex a little bit or you'll feel it in your shoulder. It's amazing what your body does to try and compensate. And that, that is another assessment that I teach in my online anatomy course that NFPT has is to put the band on the ankles and push out an abduction. Then you can externally rotate and push out. And that way you can do an assessment on yourself. Obviously, if you're working with a client, maybe you might use your hands to guide them. You can also right. use a doorway. There's a lot of ways to do these little assessments and Anyone that really wants to get into assessments, I suggest go see a physical therapist, a good a good physical therapist, someone that really understands anatomy and the mechanic, like give them an anatomy quiz before you go in. Yeah. Yeah. That was one thing I was going to say is, you know, just touching on the network, the network piece in your referral network. It's always best practice to have a physical therapist and an occupational therapist in in your in your contacts so that you can because they're, they're regardless, they're going to have that that knowledge that's. Yeah, your role is to, you know, rehab and correct injury and correct imbalance. So if it's not something that you're into, you don't want to like nerd out with attachments all day long. And that's perfectly fine. But to give your client the best experience and to ensure that they're they're going to perform optimally and or correct an issue that seems to be this lingering problem. A physical therapist is going to be somebody that is an awesome person to have in your network. Yeah, sure. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, physical therapist. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that, you know, our scope of practice as a trainer is to strengthen the body, you know, make the body str stronger. And then physical therapists come in yep. when there's an injury or there's an issue that's beyond your, your understanding. Because you're certainly not having someone come in and be like, I have hip pain. What do I do? And you're like, let's do these assessments. As soon as that word pain comes up, you say, well, what I can do is help you strengthen your hips. And you should probably see a physical therapist or a doctor. Yeah. to address the pain issue of it, but I will help you create more strength in your hips. And just talking about hips, you know, and I saw Mandy say something about a knee. I didn't get to look at it. Hmm. My weakness is my knee, a torn ACL. I just want to say that, that that strength and that balance in the hips is so important for the knee because the hip has a lot more range of motion than the knee and the foot also has a lot more range of motion in the knee and the knee can get stuck in the middle of an argument between the hip and the foot. So Having yep. your hips balanced and having your feet balanced and strong is really important. And and that's something that I'm presenting on the summer at IDEA with Stacey Lee Krause, who is a barefoot goddess. She mm -hmm. teaches barefoot exercise. Our session is called uh, Rescue Your Knees by Looking at Your Feet. It's the same thing. You can rescue your knees by looking at your hips as well. Like we, we need to have that balance because we spend a lot of time trying to like rehab the knee and make the knee happy. And mm -hmm. the knee is most happy when the hip and the foot are in agreement. Kind of like a kid, you know, like the kid is happiest when mom and dad are in agreement yeah. <laughs> or not. If mom and dad are both saying no, then maybe not. But true. No, that's that's so true, because I had an anatomy professor in my undergraduate. I think he was undergrad and he used to talk about the knee as being an anatomical nightmare um, and and talked a lot about the mobility stability chain in the body, which is something that 
that personal trainers need to know about because there are certain areas of the body that are designed to be mobile and there are other areas that are designed to be stable. And when an injury, an injury can occur distally from another joint or another group of muscles, but that could also affect something way up the kinetic chain that yeah. you wouldn't necessarily think about because, well, you know, your neck's a long way from your back. Well, from your low back. Yeah, true. But nonetheless, the body, it adapts. And I've said this before, like it's a great thing it adapts, but a negative is that it adapts. And so once something is injured and we don't address that or we're not thinking that just because an injury occurs longer down the kinetic chain, there's a possibility that's affecting something in the upward part of the kinetic chain. And so understanding that it's, it's interrelated. The body's not really separate, even though we have limbs and we have different joints that are designed to move in you know, predetermined directions it's all related. So an injury in one place is likely going to be compensated for in another area. You are a wise woman, Erin. <laughs> That's why they call me the doctor. <laughs> no. the doctor. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think that's right on. And yeah, I'm going to toss a couple blogs up here. Uh, one, because Aaron mentioned about networking with physical therapists. We have a great blog about how to network with physical therapists and also a blog all about understanding hip flexion. That blog right there is one that I wrote and have I have some videos, some videos you can watch in there to learn about how to work with your hips. So I think we'll probably close it out on that. I love that uh, Billy said, hey, ladies, get hip and Angie said, I have hips and I like to shake them. You guys are fun. So, I love it. And Angie gave a shout out for the, the anatomy course. Thank you. Shameless plugs today. But yeah. I, feel like, I feel like that that course obviously is really beneficial. And it is. I put it out there because I felt like there was a need. So thanks, Aaron, for chatting with me today. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Next week is a perfect segue topic. We're going to talk about going above and beyond as a personal trainer. So what is that next step for you? Like what um, what can you do to take it up a notch, basically? Yep. And and take your career, basically take your career to the next level. So join us next week to chat. And if you have any questions about the hips or thoughts, we would love to hear them. And if you like this episode, Click that share button, share it with some friends that have hips. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we would appreciate that. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see you guys later. All right. See you next week. <laughs>